Alright, people. So, welcome back to the fourth quarter. Hope everyone enjoyed their spring break. Um, I commonly pretty much had the entire week to sleep <laughs> and spend time with my wonderful children. So, I'm going to try this a little differently. So, the feudal system, life in the Middle Ages. You guys are going to be student leading or doing this all student led. Um, so there is not going to be a PowerPoint or a full lecture from me. This is pretty much your lecture. Um, it's going to be student paced at your own. So you're going to be able to look at this as your leisure. Um, we're going to have, for this particular assignment, you're going to have a uh, fill in the blank um, worksheet to be able to fill out your notes. And before the quiz, this is going to disappear off Google Classroom. So my suggestion is let's do the notes. Okay. So. Let's see how this is going to work. Uh, here we go. All right. So let's move this up here so you guys can look at what you need to look at. Okay. Middle East, or excuse me, Middle Ages. We've been talking about feudalism. As you can see, system of relationships that existed in Europe between kings and nobles throughout the medieval era. So these are the relationships between the kings and nobles. Uh, when it came to land, money, uh, trade, things of that nature. Saw that in the Knight's Tale a little bit where you saw some of those leaderships or some of those relationships develop. Um, d developed during in Europe during a period of great upheaval, during the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. So when the medieval time came into play, you saw Rome fall. Medieval Ages, Middle Ages came into play. Um, with the legions of Rome gone, people looked to local warlords for protection. So here, warlords, kind of like um, if you guys look at today's society, warlords can be parred with, you know, it's really sad to say, but like gang territory, people who watched over those particular areas. So um, these warlords would be looking at lo local regions to protect certain people for trade, for money, to help for their protection. Okay, so... Nice, pretty pictures. This date, you do have to remember, this 476 CE. This is the most common date given for the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Yes, I am going to quiz you on that. So this is something you need to know. In truth, the Roman Empire was crumbling for decades. We didn't really get into that, but yeah, the Roman Empire was starting to crumble because of their um, Christ because of Christianity, because of religion. Um, these guys, the Franks, Saxons, Goths, and Huns and more have been migrating into the empire for years, sometimes peacefully, sometimes not. So Rome started to get bigger. And then with all these different people, you started to see anarchy, wars, struggles throughout the entire uh, Roman Empire, which unfortunately led to its fall. Okay. Migration. If you remember migration... People migrate um, all the time. So constant migration led to instability and eventually a breakdown in Rome, in the old system of Roman control. Migration, if you put it in today's terms, from people in the Midwest and Illinois love to migrate down to Florida because it's nice and warm down there. So you can see constant migration of people into Rome led to the breakdown. Trade ceased. Villages became more isolated, so a lot of villages didn't trade with the main part of Rome. People looked for local rulers for protection. That's where the warlords came in. And Christianity remained the only constant in people's lives. So even with Rome going down and Rome falling as an empire, we still saw religion remaining that constant for people. People still looked to God and Christianity for help and for guidance. First phase of migration, many Germanic tribes. These are some of the guys you're going to get used to and get introduced to. Anglo-Saxons and the Franks. Disrupted trade and was a factor in the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So you see the Saxons here whoosh, going down to the Roman Empire. Franks, these are some people, some groups of people that started to really influence where the Roman Empire fell. And you're going to see that more in the medieval times area. There is a video. I'm not going to play the video. I'm going to leave that to you guys. You won't be able to see it um, at school because it is a YouTube video, but you are feel free to see it on your own. 
um, after we're done. But the video is basically just a uh, reinterpretation of what I'm talking about here. Okay, as you can see, all the different migrations of everybody, Western, Eastern, so the Western Roman Empire here, Eastern Roman Empire here, there's some battles with the Hans, the Visigoths, so wait, actually, let me move my little video thing over if I can, can I? I wonder if I can't, no, I can't. Okay, but underneath me, all these different lines represent all the different people that gave to the fall of Rome. You can see most of the arrows kind of coincide with Rome. Just to give you guys an idea. Okay. So, Germanic migrations. Trade was disrupted. Money became worthless. Cities abandoned. Population shifts. So this is all the effects of all these migrations of people coming in. Population shifts, decline of learning, literacy rates drop, people became more focused on necessities. So instead of focusing on learning, they became focused on more of what was more important in life, like eating, uh, surviving, <laughs> certain things that we all need to worry about um, every day. I mean, we sometimes take it for granted every day, but you always want to make sure you have food to eat, water to drink, um, things to be able to move forward. So they had to stop learning because of these German migrations, Germanic migrations, and actually just get focused on what they needed to live. Um, common language migrations brought new languages. So with more new people, dialects became more pronounced. So we had more languages in the region for people to be able to communicate. Come on. There we go. All right. Got the Franks. So let's talk about these guys. And feel free, pause this. Um, if you need to stop. That's why I wanted to do this, because it's more student pace. You guys can go at your own pace, making sure you get all the information down in a timely manner. Um, there might be two videos of this, but you can always go back to it and make sure that you're completed. So, here's some pictures of the Franks. Very interesting looking people. I know, he looks kind of mad there. So, settled in the Roman province of Gaul, present-day France, and created a powerful kingdom. Led by the Merovigian and later the Carolingian dynasties. So that's Merovingian and Carolingian Linigian. Very hard to pronounce. Lay the foundation for feudalism in Western Europe with their style of rule. So when feudalism came, these guys came. So when you think feudalism, you think the Franks. Okay. Clovis the First. Frankish warlord, Frankish warlord convert the Catholic Christianity, forming an alliance with the Church of Rome. With the Franks, the Church held considerable power. Uh, the Church was really strong. And Clovis established a Merovingian dynasty in the Kingdom of the Franks with the support of the other powerful Frankish tribal leaders. So you can see Saxons, Clovis over here, how it all spreads out. And you can see their respect to God here and their respect to how they believe with the church. And again, as you can always pause this. I'm going too quick for you. Here's that little map just to give you guys an idea. You can see where the Franks come in here. Conquest of Clovis I. How that's growing and that's spreading over towards the right. Okay. Carolingians were a noble family that became more powerful than the Merovingians. Carolingians would rule in the name of the king for most of the 8th century. So these guys came first. These guys came second. Example of a noble lord becoming more powerful than his king would happen many more times through the feudal age. You can see their representation over there. Pepin the Short. Now, no, Pepin wasn't, I don't, re I don't remember seeing anything historically of Pepin being a really short man, but he was disposed, disposed the last Merovingian king and became the first ruler of the Carolingian dynasty. So in 751, Pepin the Short took these guys out, so these guys are no more, and became the first ruler of the new Carolingian dynasty. Let's oh, move that along. So. Supported by the papacy. When you think papacy, you're thinking more of the um, the church. It's 
get a pen. Let's see if this works. Yay! So when you think the papacy, oh, that's a horrible circle. Think the papacy, you think about the church. During a feudal age, a king was only as powerful as the nobles who supported him. And you would think that's, that's too. The king you want with your king, people who are underneath you would be the nobles who are more supportive than him. Merovingians had lost the support of the Frankish nobles. Let's try the highlighter. Change that. Try the highlighter next. See if that works. Okay, so this guy, Charlemagne, son of Pepin the Short, ruled from 768 to 814. He's a guy who established this particular empire, so that's a little better. I think I'll use that. Relied on the military support of his nobles, so he relied on support. So he got support from his nobles. It's changed these nobles will govern different parts of Charlemagne's realm as well as receiving treasures. Form of governing is the hallmark of feudalism. So the exchange, so it's kind of like you do this for this, you do this for this, that is important to think about. And receiving treasure Conquer territories. Always good to remember that. Okay. Frankish kingdom, territories gained by Charlemagne. You see here Charlemagne with the dark green and then the light green. This is what we know already. But you can see these are kind of going in a little bit. So he is gaining some traction. Checking my time here. I might have to go two videos, guys, because I only have a 15 minute cap on each one. So, Charlemagne's empire did not last long after his death. So, think about that. So, did not last long. So, after he died, people came in, took over for him. Frankish tradition for a father's land to be distributed amongst his sons. Kind of sounds like what we do today. Sons inheriting father's wealth, father's land. The division among, along with increasing raids from Viking, Muslim, and Magar caused the Carolingian Empire to splinter and crumble. So we had division. We had raids. Caused this empire to crumble. Okay, second phase, Slavic tribes, Moors, here's where the Vikings come, we've already talked about them, yay, not Minnesota, but the actual Vikings. These guys all started to invade, ensure there would be no strong central power, so these guys came in to disrupt, so they would have no power for long. They came in, they saw an opportunity, and they wreaked havoc. Okay, Muslims in the orange, red, here's the Viking settlements, the Vikings land, the Magars over here in the green. So you can see, and you see the purple arrows where the Viking invasions are starting to go, the Magar invasions, and the Muslim invasions as well. So you can see how they're spread out. And how they're coming in to play up where Rome is right in here. Okay, so at the end here, guys, I'm going to be capped at 15 minutes. So with the Warlords, I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to do part two of this to finish it out. Shouldn't be no more than two 15-minute videos. Again, fill in your worksheets. Make sure they are filled out to get the proper credit. So you're prepared for the next quiz that's coming around the corner. Plus, this will probably be good for a possible final coming up at the end of the year. Okay, talk to you soon.